we are here because we want to meet with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need his presence. We need that lift in our hearts from him. It's been a year of difficulty, but God, he is still on the throne and he's still living in our hearts. So we just begin with a word of prayer. We ask, Lord Jesus, will you come, as you have promised, to be in the midst of us this morning? Your promise where two or three are gathered, so you will be in our midst. As you walked amongst the candlesticks of your church that were lit, I pray that our hearts will be so warm this morning as we begin to praise you. Lord, will you just clear the dark clouds from our hearts? Will we leave our troubles here down on earth as you raise us, Lord, into the heavenly places this morning that we might soar with you in wonder and adoration as we worship and adore you, King of Kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through the generations. Sing, bless the Lord.
all of his goodness. As we raise thankfulness and praise in our hearts to the Lord, it clears the dark clouds, enables us to see the sun, glimpses of heaven, God's delight in us. Thank you, Jesus. Recognize that Jesus reigns. Just let that praise in your heart lift up to Him as an offering of thanks. Today's reading is taken from Psalm 137, verses 1 to 8. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There, on the populace, we hung our harps. For there, our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. We come today almost ready for the final session of Lent. I've picked Psalm 137 and 1st Peter chapter 2 11 to 17 uh, as my Bible reading but my main theme is going to be on Psalm 137 and I want to give you a background of this psalm in around 597 BC King Jehoiachim of Judah decided to rebel against the superpower of that time the kingdom of Babylon Babylon had just attacked the forces of 
Egypt, which was the second most strong, the second strongest uh, superpower around the area, and they had a, a big defeat. So Jehoiachim decided to take advantage of that, and uh, he decided to rebel. He didn't want to pay uh, tribute to, uh, which was a lot, to the Babylonians. And the Babylonians surrounded Judah, and three months after a siege of Jerusalem, Jerusalem fell. Many died, many, and imagine a siege means you blocking food, blocking all the supply going into the, the city. Uh, the good thing about Jerusalem is it's built so that there is actually a secret stash of water um, at the end of the wall. But, um, you know, the water uh, can also be uh, caused to be toxic. So really, um, three months siege is quite a long time for them. But Jerusalem fell. Many were taken captive, including the prophet Daniel and the prophet Ezekiel. And then King Zedekiah was put in place as a puppet king. He was the brother, younger brother. Yeah, I think he was the youngest brother of uh, King Jehoiachim. Zedekiah was meant to keep a stability in Judah, but he was meant to actually serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And around 589 BC, against the advice of Jeremiah the prophet, Zedekiah decided to stand up against Nebuchadnezzar. Two years later, after a six-month siege, can you imagine no food coming in? Disease, because you couldn't get any dirt out. And people starved, a lot died. And when they broke through the wall six months later, they, came, they went and killed everybody. Zedekiah was captured and he was blinded after that, after seeing his sons killed. So his whole lineage gone. The temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was razed, and many were taken, uh, all actually, apart from those who were servicing the land, were taken to various parts of Babylon. <clears throat> the people were broken, the people were very, very uh, depressed, because the city, the city where God lived with them, was a rubble didn't look like any hope of going back to God's kingdom again. During that time as well, the Edomites, who were the neighbours of Judah, they had a lot of ill feeling between the border. So you can imagine it's, uh, I suppose, like in the European nations as well, we have a little bit of ill feeling among certain countries. I don't want to mention countries, but you know, people name call each other and in the background there is a little bit of um, ill feeling. But that was worse between Edom and Judah. And at the end of Psalm 137, there's this horrific picture um, which we will read in a in a minute. And this ill feeling contributed to that situation, that, that little passage of pain and hurt that the psalmist is depicting. So bear in mind that there is this feeling, that there is this sense that the Edomites looked at this and they laughed and they mocked and they, they cheered on for the forces of Nebuchadnezzar to create havoc in the land of Egypt, uh, Judah, to remove everything, to cleanse the temple, to destroy it. Now, I will do the reading, Psalm 137, 1 to 9, and 1 Peter 2, 11 to 17. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There we hung up our lyres 
on the poplar trees. For our captors there asked us for songs, our tormentors for rejoicing. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song on foreign soil? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not exalt Jerusalem as my greatest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites said that day at Jerusalem. Destroy it! Destroy it! Destroy it down to its foundations! Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who pays you back what you have done to us. Happy is the one who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. 1 Peter 2, 11 to 17 Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God the day he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as they sent out, as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honour everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honour the emperor. <clears throat> as you can see, I come from a different culture. My background is from Southeast Asia. And so I think my understanding of the Psalms is a little, of Psalm 137 is a little bit different. I wasn't dragged here by force to adapt to this culture. I wasn't restricted to what, what I could do and what I couldn't do. Yet, I think I do have a little understanding about living in a strange land. My first year was filled with doubts, insecurity. I wanted to go back. Every, every minute I wanted to go back. I had no ties, no binding to this country. The way of life was so different. Pubs, clubs, parties. It just wasn't my scene. Even in church, I felt a stranger. People were so friendly, but there was this distance that did not exist in my hometown, in my home church. That family atmosphere wasn't there. You go to church, you say hello, smile, hug, or shake hands. It wasn't hugs in those days, it was shaking hands in those days. Um, and I was invited to people's homes for meals. Uh, it was really good, but everyday life, there wasn't that close family environment. I didn't have a support structure. I didn't have anybody I could confide in. I didn't have someone or a group of people whom I could say I love them and I trust them because they are there for me. Everyone was in Malaysia. The Jews in exile in Babylon, however, they were taken by force. They were taken, they were tested. Uh, the war, sorry, lasted two years. The second defeat and the temple was destroyed. It was a symbol of God in their midst. Destroyed. It was that hope that whatever they did, 
they could rectify by going and serving God in the temple, by worshipping him in the temple. But that was taken away. This psalm describes the devastating feeling of being alone, far removed from this one person they felt a link to. The joy, the happiness, and more than anything, far removed from their one hope. The one who saved them out of Egypt from slavery. They never forget that. Even today, the Jews never forget that God took them out of slavery. There is this very close relationship with God. But by the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, that hope was dashed. Their identity, their lifestyle, that family life in God was taken away from them. The emotion is one of desolation, depression, loss. At the end of the psalm, we can see the, this expression of feelings, how intense it was. You see, the thing is, someone who did that to you, someone who perpetrated the worst thing that you could experience, gives you that sensation of, ah, oh, God will deal with you. And that was vented against the Babylonians, the Edomites especially, who rejoiced that the holy place of God was destroyed, the symbol of God's presence in their life taken away. It was a feeling of raw pain. And as you can see, they wished for the end of their lineage. Once your, your young ones are taken away, there's no, nothing forward. Because that's what happened to their king. The last king, Zedekiah, had his, all his sons killed. And so that was the end of the lineage of kings, kings in Israel. And so the, the backdrop of the people of Babylon asking them, Oh, play us a song. Come on, we want to hear your song. You're famous for your songs. They could not play any requests. They were far removed from the one thing that they were singing about. Their close relationship with God. Not so long ago, they were taken out of Egypt, as I said, and God gave them this land and Jerusalem was where he promised he would live with them. The slavery in, in Egypt was a painful event that affected their whole people. And I don't think you'll find any Jew who will forget that event. And you, are, you may ask why, uh, it's the past, but you know, things like that tend to haunt you. If you've got someone in your family who's suffered grave, grievously and who's passed it on because this must never happen again, it haunts you. And the only way to get around this is to concentrate on worshipping God. And that's what the Jews did. <laughs> In our country today, and in the USA, South Africa, Myanmar, many, many other countries, there are people who were enslaved, who are now starting to cry out for some righteous act to happen, for some parity, for some justice. This is a real thing. To the Israelites in exile, it certainly was real. Jerusalem is where God resided with his people. God promised them he would be with them 
and took them to the promised land and he lived with them in the temple. Even today, the area around there is terrible animosity about Jerusalem, as you know. The Jews will fight tooth and nail for Jerusalem because that's where they know that God had promised them that they would live with him. Forgetting Jerusalem is like forgetting God. Forgetting the end of slavery and forgetting their deliverer. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And it goes on to say that it is better to have a stroke and to live with only one limb for any use than to, live, than to forget the living God. It is better to be dumb than to forget God's ways. The enemies of God want to destroy God's rule. The enemy wants to rule our lives. He wants to take away that building block of God close to us. Why? It's obvious. It's about power. It's about control. The enemy wants to rule our lives. But the psalmist says, God will destroy them. Those that keep his people from him will be destroyed. And those who seek justice against the persecuted will be blessed. The destruction will be complete. Nothing will remain. So you know, God is always there true for you. And there's only one thing that needs to happen. And we'll talk about it. In the letter that Peter wrote, in the, the, the passage that I just read, he describes the church as foreigners and exiles in the land. In the whole letter, Peter advises how we should live in this foreign land, how we should conduct ourselves in a strange land, not being tempted to conform with the ways of the land, but to follow God's ways. It's very hard for us who were born and bred here to understand this in fullness, because for us, this is our home, this is our land. But really, in our spiritual lives, in lives with God, God wants you to know that this is a temporary place. This is where you were born, but not where you're going to live with God. I eventually settled in England back in 1990. I married and brought my wife over and started building relationships with people, built a support system, and have maintained comfort and call this place my home. I'm too comfortable. The more comfortable I get, the less I remember God. What I mean is that the more I get to come into a routine of living life here, the less I have time to interact with God. And this was the way in Babylon. This was the way after the event of the cross. We are all living in an environment that has significant influences in the way we live. Our choices in life are tainted by this environment and its cultural influences. How we set our goals, our future, our family's future, we are all influenced by this worldly environment. When I went to theological college in Singapore, there were people around me that were very disappointed in my decision because they felt that, oh, he's minimized his potential. Yet, I believe 
that God called me for a certain job. And I can see now the fruition of this area that I was supposed to serve. We are called to be set apart. We are called to stick to God very diligently. It's the only path to joy, peace and everlasting life. Being separated from God should feel devastating. We should feel the view that the Jews felt, the pain that they felt, the very uncomfortable life that they had because they were separated from God. God must have a physical presence in our lives and we should feel that. If we don't feel that, that's where avenues of our life can lead to depression, great sadness, loss, feeling of real, real pain. This is how strong we should feel being away from God's presence. As Christians, We live with God as he has given us his Holy Spirit. Paul reminds us that our bodies are God's temple. He resides in us. So if we destroy the temple, if we take away the place of God in the center of our hearts, we are going to be alone. How can we feel joy, happiness, peace? if we destroy the peace, the place that God set for us to dwell in. We have to keep it holy. We have to keep this temple a place fit for a king to live in. We have three things that are vital in our relationship with God. Three things that ensure God will reside in our lives and this will ensure happiness, joy, peace. If you follow this path, you will find complete joy, the joy that the Jews felt in Jerusalem. The first thing is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. Secondly, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And thirdly, go and make people from all nations into disciples, immersing them into the realities of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey anything that I have commanded you. And remember, I will be with you always. This is from Matthew 28, 19 to 20. A few weeks ago, we actually discussed Psalm 24. And we discussed about approaching God's temple and how living outside God's temple was not the desirable thing. So as we approach God's temple, we need to prepare ourselves to live with God. Now, we know that the temple has been destroyed. How do we come and reconstruct the temple so that God can live with us again? We should be longing for God to be with us. If God is not with us, we should feel uncomfortable. We should feel pain. We should feel that something's not right and do something about it. But you know, in that passage, there's also a hope by the psalmist. God will rescue us. And the rescuer, the person who brought that rescue in our lives, will be blessed. And we must reflect in the way we live. 
If you want God to reside in your lives, Peter emphasizes that we must conduct ourselves honorably among non-believers. Let them observe your good works and they will glorify God on the day God visits. Now Lent offers a time to prepare for this mission. Holy Week is approaching. Jesus spent 40 days preparing for his journey to Jerusalem, his task, his mission, towards the King's throne. As we approach Holy Week, we should reflect on how we can make changes in our lives. We have to accommodate for God residing in our lives. Are we living in God's presence? Do we feel the dread of being separated from God? The same dread the Jews felt in Babylon. If you have not felt peace, joy and happiness in your lives, maybe you could explore this. It's an alternative. You can call our church making a visit to us. Speak to one of our pastoral teams. You can ask for me, Lionel, and we could discuss anything you want to discuss. <laughs> Living with God is our ultimate goal. There is no catch. There is nothing that we have ulterior motives about. We truly believe that God has changed us. God has made us better. We believe in love. We believe that we can heal this nation, this world, because, not because of us. We are terrible. We are sinners. We desire God's presence in our lives. If not, we cannot function. And we want to share this with you. As we approach Easter, a Christian's most joyful celebration, it is the symbol of victory over death, over a life of decay. We can be assured that God is real in our lives and he will reside with us only if we let him in. He knocks at our door. And all we have to do is open that door. You know, he gives us a choice. And it's all up to you. And he will reside with us if we let him, if we respond to his love. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Show us how to live in a place where we are aware of our constant communion with you. As your children, we humbly come before you. Thank you that we get to rest under the shelter of your wings here in the secret place of your presence. We praise you and worship you, Lord. We humbly hand over our hearts to you and say, Lord, here's my heart. Search me and know me. Show me anything in my life that is keeping me from being as close as I can be with you. As you show us these things in our hearts and in our lives, Holy Spirit, will you show us what you would like us to do? Anything that is hindering us, that is keeping us from constantly seeing you clearly. Anything that is distorting our vision. Anything that could be blinding us. We ask you, Lord that you will cleanse us. Renew and restore our vision. Give us wisdom and discernment, eyes that see and ears that hear you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the work you have done in us. Lead us today and help us to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for all the blessings you pour out on us day by day, for your mercy and your grace. 
a flood over us, Lord. We thank you that you sent Jesus and that he was willing to go to the cross and die for us so that we might be in relationship with you. Oh, Father, we're so thankful. Thank you that you called us into families, Lord God, into this church family. Help us, Lord, to play our part in it, to share in the loving and the caring. Lord, prompt us when we need to say a word or make a phone call or give a helping hand that we might show your love amongst us as family. Lord, we pray for those who are sick. Lord, we know you promised to be our healer. And so we pray for them to know your healing pouring through their bodies, Lord God. May they find themselves being renewed and strengthened by you. We pray for those who are anxious, afraid, depressed or lonely. Lord God, we just pray that they would know your presence, your truth, your joy and your light in their darkness, Lord God. May they be lifted by you into your beautiful presence, Lord. We pray for those who mourn, Lord. We feel sad for them. Lord, we pray for them to know your comfort and your presence with them. We pray especially for Basil traveling to Romania and to the funeral of his father, Lord God. I pray for him, that he would know your comfort. I pray, Lord God, that you would protect him and keep him safe and bring him back safely to his family. And we pray for them too, Lord God as they mourn, that you would be their comfort. Father, we thank you for our town of Mansfield. We thank you for this opportunity we've had to give out leaflets, offering hope, Lord God. I pray that people have read them and that they reach out to you. I thank you, Father, for Teen Challenge, for the wonderful work that they are doing and all that they offer, Lord God. Thank you for those who respond to them, the many. You are being prayed for, Lord God. I thank you. May they reach out to you and know your salvation, Lord God. We pray for our government and this nation, Lord God, that our freedoms might be cherished here, that they might act with righteousness and justice, Lord God. We pray against any acts of parliament or bills that would take away people's freedoms or cause persecution to any group, Lord God. We ask that those would fall to the ground, that always your righteousness and justice would flow here. We pray for nations around the world, Lord God, where people suffer violence, poverty, natural disasters, Lord God, and so the many that are refugees, Lord God. We think of them. We thank you for those who are working with them, Lord God. We thank you for their compassionate service. We pray for them all the resources they need, Lord God, and your help and your presence with them. Father, we pray that the, those of us who are richer nations, Lord God, that we would be compassionate to them and care about them, Lord God, and give practical help where we can, Father. We thank you for our world that was so beautiful, Lord God. We're sorry, Father. We made such a mess of it, but we ask you to help us to care for it now, to maybe reverse some of the damage, Lord God. I pray for the countries around the world to care, Lord, and to think about the future of their children, grandchildren, as we do, Lord God. We ask you to help us to care for that. Lord, we ask your blessing upon our children, upon the children of this church family. May they know your presence with them. Lord, may your blessing rest upon them. And each one of us, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, it's been wonderful to worship here with you today. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And may we go now in the love and the power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working in us as we go out on our way into this world that so needs love and the good news of Christ's love for them. God bless you.